All right, overall thoughts about this week's reading? Do you have any? Yeah. Or maybe even just general thoughts about what you think of the book so far? I thought these two chapters applied to my life pretty well, especially right now, in just the time life I'm in. Hmm. Uh, like, I mean, they kind of just, they both went together in t- temptations and wandering thoughts and rejection. Um, yeah, now that you say that, actually, I can see how these, at least in the titles of the two chapters, how much this, this could uh, especially apply to a young person's life. Yeah. So they're both very to- important topics, especially for young people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought they just kind of applied to some things I've been struggling with a little bit in life, and it was good to see you know, just a writing about how to like deal with those things. Mm-hmm. And also, it's nice to be able to have the opportunity to discuss it with you guys. So. Yeah, I hope to hear your thoughts about it. Uh, I'll go through it. Just out of curiosity, you guys, uh, have you discussed this uh, book that much with anyone else outside of the Young Brothers meeting? Like, has anyone asked you about it, or has it been brought in conversation? Just no one's asked wondering me. Wondering if anyone ever. Sometimes with uh, Emmanuel. And oh, yeah. Not yet. Emmanuel. Sure. Yeah, you should talk Emmanuel. about it with uh, my parents, because they're reading along with us. Yeah, it's them especially. I wonder. Or I'd, I'd want to know, like, what they think about it so far. I doubt they've been staying on on the same time chapters. No, they well, are there. I don't think they're listening into our times as much anymore, which is obvi- which is fine, of course. But I just wanted to know, like, what they think. No, of that's that's how they're reading it. Following along with. Our yeah, they're just listening to ours and oh, they're going okay. through the readings with us. That's cool. Well, my dad's already uh, he's already read it once, so this is the second time through. Okay, nice. But yeah, it's cool to see, especially from my mom's perspective, uh, just, it's a whole completely different way of looking at things kind of through her lens, but it is really encouraging to talk about it with them and then, you know, get their feedback once they do listen to our meetings. You, are your parents listening to the meeting? No, they want to. Yeah. Yeah, I would very much like to hear more of your parents' mm-hmm. thoughts about it at some point. <clears throat> All right, why don't we get started then? So this is Spiritual Progress by Finland on Chapter 11 on Temptations. I'm able to improve my reading a little bit. <laughs> this is kind of tough to read out loud. <clears throat> I know of but two resources against temptations. One is faithfully to follow the interior light and sternly and immediately cutting off everything we are at liberty to dismiss and which may excite or strengthen the temptation. I say everything which we are at liberty to dismiss because we are not always permitted to avoid the occasions of evil, such as are unavoidable connected with the particular position in which providence has placed us are not considered to be within our power. The other expedient consists in turning towards God in every temptation without being disturbed or anxious to know that we have not already yielded a sort of half consent and without interrupting our immediate recourse to God. By examining too closely whether we have not been guilty of some unfaithfulness, we incur the risk of being again entangled in the the temptation. The shortest and surest way is to act like a little child at the breast. When we show it in a frightful monster, when we show it a frightful monster, it shrinks back and buries its face in its mother's bosom, that it may no longer hold it. Some interesting wisdom there in approaching temptation in that the more we <clears throat> that's basically what he's saying is the more we try to think about whether or not we've yielded to the temptation or not and that's our primary concern, the more that we'll actually begin to yield to it, and the more that we'll fall prey to whatever the temptation is. Because the concern is, that's what, that's the, uh, 
the sign of a developing guilt in the conscious or in the conscience <coughs> sorry I always get those two words mixed up is that we are we're obsessed with <coughs> trying to determine whether or not we've already stained ourselves with whatever it is we're being tempted by whether or not we've yielded to it and when that is our concern then we're probably going to make it worse mm -hmm. so that's why he uses the example of a little child the child is not worried about whether it's uh, it's not concerned about whether it's done something wrong <coughs> in a certain sense its concern is the danger at hand and so it reacts to it in a very simple hearted way by just turning away from it without any premeditation <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty simple steps are really good, and that's do anything you can to avoid it, right? Put yourself in an environment for success mm -hmm. by eliminating everything that you can. Uh, and when inevitably, you know, you do run into evil, run. Mm -hmm. uh, I think of, I think it's Proverbs 7, which is really good on temptation uh, hmm. that talks about I was that. talking to the adulteress yeah that's yeah, Proverbs 5 I think maybe it mentioned in 7 too but that, that, yeah yeah Proverbs the 7 adulterous woman's mentioned a lot of Proverbs though yeah but <coughs> I really like kind of that like why would you even get close to the proverbial cliff right mm. why would you even and I think it even mentions it later like, why would you even get close to the temptation? You know, so you'll give in, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, that other part of it <clears throat> that we're touching on does also come from a, a uh, false perception of self. So on the one hand, we discussed earlier about how we're concerned with whether or not we've yielded to the temptation. There's also the uh, presumptuousness that accompanies a perception of self that we can, we have the self-control to step closer to something than we should. So we, mm -hmm. we there's like a an inordinate trust in ourselves or confidence in ourselves and that's never where we should be especially around temptations in fact uh, yeah it's an interesting combination of knowing one's limits and also relying on as I think you'll talk about relying on God as the person who really gives us the strength to mm -hmm. move away from something or towards another thing. Yeah, I think by our own means <clears throat> we will always fail. Mm -hmm. And any time that you know, we're able to overcome that temptation, it's never by our own strength. Yeah. So it's, yeah, never, never actually thinking that we have the ability to be close to it. I like what you're saying. It's almost like a false confidence. Yes. Yeah. When going about life, so not even necessarily in the the uh, the scenario of temptation, what really guards us as people who do make our our own decisions, people that are responsible for our own decisions, small and great, throughout the day, it really guards us. And what the Lord has given us to offer direction in those areas is a conscience. So when we have a sensitive conscience, then it's almost a kind of compass in a way. But our conscience, our conscience is not a replacement uh, for the Holy Spirit, obviously, but the conscience is something, is something that the Holy Spirit uses mm -hmm. 
It's like that part of us that the Holy Spirit touches so as to communicate something to us. So, the reason I bring up consci- conscience, ah, goodness sakes, yeah, conscience, I hope I haven't been saying conscious. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I just really got to get that down. It's funny, your mom, I think, has, or at least in the past, she had a similar problem we were joking about it a while ago, but, <laughs> uh, the reason I bring up conscience is because <clears throat> it's actually something that can be calloused the more that we convince ourselves that we are tough enough or wise enough or self-controlled enough but then we actually end up yielding to the temptation and it may bite us for a while and we we come about or we come we like regress and repent and it becomes a pattern unfortunately and that's when the conscience becomes calloused and then you're you're making you're you're going down a a very dangerous road. It doesn't matter what the temptation is. It's just the way temptation works generally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think of the even Tim's teaching a couple of weeks ago. I don't know the Israelites' hearts became calloused, mm-hmm. and the biggest and how that happens is repetition. Yeah, they constantly ignored God, and it. It became so they became spiritually deaf because of it to the point where they couldn't even hear because they had ignored him so many times. Yeah. And that is really a dangerous place to be is when you're yielding to those temptations and you don't even necessarily feel bad about it or as bad as you should mm-hmm. anymore because you've almost like worn that muscle out. Yeah. about how too in those places when you find yourself uh, being tempted that it's like uh, one of the most needed times of praise and how it's also one of the like mm-hmm. the hardest times to come to that heart of praise towards God mm-hmm. and I think it's just like the like a verbal whatever like it's a heart and like a mind change, you know. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yeah, it's that's it's it is really hard because you mm-hmm. obviously you're you're not wanting to give in to the temptation, but at the same time you almost want to a little bit because it's tempting, right? <coughs> and in that moment it's really hard to reach out to God for help and kind of take sanctuary in him. <coughs> Because usually what's tempting us is really something that's trying to take us away from him. You know, that's mm-hmm. the root of but all I, of it. But I do think when it comes to temptation, that's one of the biggest things mm-hmm. is learning to bring, like, in that moment of temptation, coming before God. Because uh, you'll you'll realize it's, it's really tricky. It's really hard. Because mm-hmm. everything that is tempted is telling you not to. Why don't we continue here to see what he proposes as the remedy. <clears throat> the sovereign remedy is the habit of dwelling continually in the presence of God. He sustains, consoles, and calms us. We must never be astonished at temptations, be they never so outrageous. On this earth, all is temptation. Crosses tempt us by irritating our pride, and prosperity by flattering it. Our life is a continual combat, but one in which Jesus Christ fights for us. We must pass on unmoved, while temptations rage around us, as the traveler, overtaken by a storm, simply wraps his cloak more closely about him, and pushes on more vigorously towards his destined home. If the thought of former sins and wretchedness should be permitted to come before us, we must remain confounded and abashed before God, quietly enduring in His adorable presence all the shame and ignominy of our transgressions. We must not, however, seek to entertain or call up so dangerous a recollection. So what is it? 
what's in essence what is it when it says we must not seek to entertain or call up such a dangerous recollection what so, recollection is it he's talking about our former sins and wretchedness as he puts it so it's not so that's not something that we should willingly per se bring up in our own minds but obviously the way that the thought life works is that it's it's not something entirely in our control when it comes to the inception of a thought Mm -hmm. but what is under our control is the ability to take those thoughts captive yes and taking them captive means it's something that we we objectively uh, are conscious of and even something that we objectively analyze perhaps Mm -hmm. and in so doing bring it before God is really the the point of taking them captive. It's like the prisoner of war analogy I think my dad used. Mm-hmm. It's like finding right. out where it came from. Yeah, that's yeah, I was about to say it's, it's something that that's I guess part of the analysis of the thought is is trying to determine where it is that the thought came from, what encourages such thoughts. And also taking into account what is likely to come about if that thought is entertained or Um, allowed to continue to grow or expound in the mind so it's saying when thoughts of your previous sins come up that's not a beneficial when thoughts yeah he's saying that's that's the time in which as he puts it we should come before God Mm -hmm. in his words confounded and abashed so realizing that yes those those past sins are are still something that is written in our past and cannot be undone that's that's the real weight that's the real burden of the past for anyone is that once something's done it can't be undone so but the the uh the confounding that we experience is the realization that the Lord has forgiven us of those sins and that that those sins have been covered and that they no longer define who we are now. The past doesn't define us in that sense. It's who we are now, where the Lord has us now and what he's bringing us into. That's what should be the primary concern and uh, impetus or driver of our, our hearts. That's what really should that's what really should define us. And the the abashed is the it's it's that that lingering, if you will, that lingering repentance or part of repentance. Mm-hmm. So a recollection of past sins, mistakes, and wretchedness is something that we can realize uh as something that the Lord allowed to surface in our minds to perhaps bring us to a place of humility, humility again. And so, while we shouldn't necessarily try to forcefully humble ourselves by, by always bringing up these, these past mistakes that we made, when they do come up, just accept those things naturally as a way to perhaps re-level or uh, tune yourself to a a lower <laughs> uh, position when it comes to your perception of yourself as not as someone that is truly nothing without God and what he has done in your life what he has put into you because we are truly nothing apart from him there's no good thing in us so I can continue here unless you guys have more thoughts in conclusion it may be said that in doing what God wills there is very little to be done by us and yet there is a wonderful work to be accomplished no less than that of reserving nothing and making no resistance for a moment to that jealous love which searches inexorably into the most secret recesses of the soul the smallest trace of self 
for the slightest intimations of an affection of which itself is not the author. So, on the other hand, true progress does not consist in a multitude of views, nor in austerities, trouble, and strife. It is simply willing nothing and everything, without reservation and without choice, cheerfully performing each day's journey as providence appoints it for us, seeking nothing, refusing nothing, finding everything in the present moment, and suffering God, who does everything to, to do his pleasure in us and by us without the slightest resistance. Oh, how happy is he who has attained to the state, and how full of good things is his soul when it appears emptied of everything. Let us pray the Lord to open to us the whole infinitude of his paternal heart, that our own may be there submerged and lost, so that it may make but one with his, such was the desire of Paul for the faithful, when he longed for them in the bowels of Jesus Christ. I want to hear a little bit more from y'all before I move on. I really liked something that Tim had shared a Tuesday or two ago mm -hmm. um, concerning those low points or those... <coughs> Uh, where when we're being tempted, mm -hmm. I guess he was illustrating the picture of kind of in that moment when we choose to instead of dwelling in that you know uh, mind I don't know what you saying but when we choose to give up to the Lord, it's kind of like our soul is once again directed to the altar. And then, oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember you talking about it. And <clears throat> the Lord isn't condescending in the way that he um, even tries to condemn us for what we have done, or like that state of mind. But it's mm -hmm. more like, um, I don't remember the feeling, that, but like, just like welcoming it, you know, mm -hmm. in, in agreement with your decision to once again burn it up. Yeah, I think the way he was illustrating it is, uh, I can't remember what scenarios he was give his, giving as an example of when the soul would uh, posture itself in this way, but he's saying it's, I think it's when you contemplate the idea of selflessness and the, the death of self that the soul kind of, as my dad put it, peeks his head in and begins to get a little interested, so to speak, because it's starting to get a little irritated. We all know what that feeling is like, especially when, putting it frankly, when we're engaging in spiritual times, the soul can sometimes get in a place where it's like it does kind of peep its head in and gets a little bit ruffled. And that's when my dad would say, like, your spirit man will look at your soul and invite it in to be laid that's on the right. altar. That's right. Yeah. And uh, I think just like everything else, that's something that becomes uh, easier. Not that it will ever be easy, but that's something that becomes natural, more natural to us, the more that it's done. So even that can be considered a practice, something that you can mature in obviously it's it's not like this once and for all mm -hmm. come to the altar so that this can be done at last but that's yeah. something that just it's as we daily, daily sorry not do so just we daily bear our crosses is something that we also learn to daily lay ourselves down mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah this chapter just put a, another perspective on just how wild it fascinates me how, and seeing it to myself the most, is just how humans and mankind is just so, like, I don't want to use 
like animalistic maybe in the way that we are so self-centered and um, just our carnal nature I think is really interesting to me mm -hmm. because I mean even what you're saying about we're basically not really anything without without the God the person God has made us to be and like whenever we stray from that especially people who know they have a calling especially people who know or have had a glimpse into who they are and who God's called them to be you know when you when you stray away from that you just looking back on those times you're just you're just how foolish it seems you're just nobody and I think temptations and the, even the next chapter kind of going to that a little bit is when we like kind of stray from from God's will and are tempted by all sorts of things in the world and um, and it's just crazy how, how, how merciful God is to us mm -hmm. at the same time because we really don't deserve it it's kind of like being I don't know I was just chasing the duck down the hill today <laughs> like it was like because we kind of try to keep it in the pen and just running ahead and trying to do its own thing and I imagine that's probably what we look like to God a lot of the time it's just a little huh. thing trying to do its own thing and biting at him and it's like don't do that like I don't want to do that but we don't understand you know the greater purpose because mm -hmm. we are on such a not only are we on a such a lower level it's funny because the duck doesn't have the option to understand you know we have the option to understand but a lot of times we just choose not to which is pretty weird mm -hmm. um or even to try um yeah so I think temptations are something well, they're obviously something created by God as as bad as some temptations or whatever may be it's they are placed there by God in a way or some things are used as tools by God to test us something I was kind of listening to in the Derek Prince uh, teaching today um, what was he saying Something about like to you maybe even temptations or like, maybe you're saying sin or us sinning. It's it's all a test of our. Well, maybe you're saying all the tests that God gives us are tests of our faith in Him, and in, in all sorts of ways they're usually at, at the root of it. They're all a test of our faith in God. I think temptations very well fit into that. Temptations are a test of our trust in God and our reliance on his right hand and his and him basically but not to rely on our own strength to not be tempted or our own strength to <clears throat> overcome things in life but yeah hmm. Hmm. yeah and that same teaching because I listened to it today too uh, the, the patience of God is is, is definitely an unfathomable thing to me too is looking at my own life <clears throat> and not just not even just where I have been but even where I am now in some ways uh, yeah and, and that teaching as well one thing that Derek would touch on a lot is the importance of endurance and uh, I don't know if you guys have listened to much Derek Prince and at least enough to where you've come across his statement where he says the only way to endure the only solution uh, for endurance is to endure <laughs> that's yeah. what he always says yeah, that's for sure the only way to endure is to endure. And that works. Or, or that's, that's something that we should all have in mind. 
yeah, certainly in temptation, but in, in anything in life that uh, requires uh, our effort and our uh, faith in God and reliance upon His His work in our lives and His presence in our lives. I think there's one point in the teaching where Derek mentions a, a difference between patience and endurance. As a, patience is a kind of inaction, mm-hmm. but endurance, I think, requires a level of patience, but it requires even more than that. It even requires some, some, some action on our part to keep walking forward. I don't know if he if he puts it that way in the teaching or not, but sometimes endurance requires more than just a sitting still and waiting to let things play out. Yeah. And there's a I'm trying to find it at the very end of one of the chapters, uh, but it almost talks of temptation like it's a blindfold mm. to where you don't even realize the severity of your situation. Kind of like the dumb ox being led to the slaughterhouse like it talks about in Proverbs to where it really that really does kind of put a blindfold on you and you kind of just follow it sometimes. Mm. And like uh, Spiritual Progress was saying a long time ago, it's like a lot of the time we don't even realize you know, what we did until it's done. And then it kind of hits you. But it's just kind of an interesting thought process, I guess. Just like, I don't know, I think Proverbs really does sum it up well when it talks about the adulteress. Mm-hmm. I'm reminded too of the the Lord's Prayer or mm-hmm. the prayer that Jesus gave his disciples where in the end it says and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one and so there's still a yearning on the heart of in the heart of uh a son of God or a disciple to to be so uh, full of faith in who God is and where God has put him in this life to even be beyond the realm of temptation in a certain way not that living on this earth even as Finolin puts it he says you say on this earth all is temptation Mm -hmm. but I think there is a way there's a means uh, by which we we do come to a place where temptation is still temptation but it's not tempting the temptation itself is not as (laughs) tempting as it as it used to be because we have become so established as sons in God's house that we are part of a new order and flow of life where the life of a son or of a a disciple is no longer one of, of trying to reach that place of it always being a matter of uh, learning things the hard way but they've become so established in the uh the order of God's house and the relationships therein it has become so uh, exemplary of God's heart and way that temptation is it's like a it's it's not like a prowling beast anymore it's like a little fly I can put it that way
it's still there. It's annoying. But it's it's like a fly now. <laughs> it's not like a prowling lion. Found the uh, quote. This is at the end of chapter four. We must be firm and observing our rules. The strictness seems excessive, but without everything, without it, everything falls into confusion. We become dissipated, relaxed, and lose strength. We insensibly separate from God, surrender ourselves to all our pleasures, and only then begin to perceive that we have wandered. When it almost, when it is almost hopeless to think of endeavoring to return. Prayer. Prayer, this is our only safety. Blessed be the God which has not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. And to be faithful in prayer, it is, in, it is indispensable that we should dispose all the employments of the day. With the regularity, nothing can disturb. Yeah, that kind of ties back to you know what you were saying. That when the moments where it's hardest to pray, that's when it's the best moments to pray. But yeah, I think there is like a there's definitely a way that like almost temptations is almost like a chain reaction sometimes. Like when you're lured into that sense of being relaxed, when you give into one thing, it just causes like a because then you're already vulnerable, and I think of like kind of letting your guard down a little bit, and I think of, yeah, and then that just opens the door for one thing, which then lets the walls down, and it keeps going. It's almost like, it reminds me of, still, we as sons have the choice to operate in a certain way, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's the way that we live is by that holy order that the Lord is wanting to establish. So when we succumb to those temptations, it's like we're lowering that standard. And, that's, mm -hmm. and I think something that's definitely helped me even in recent, you know, struggles and temptation is mm -hmm. realizing that and that it's more than even sometimes a personal struggle, but also... Yeah, it's sure. affecting the body, and that's uh, a sickening thought, you know, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It brings it to where it's just like beyond yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somewhat along Elijah's earlier point, temptation certainly, as with any adverse circumstance, temptation does allow us to. Uh, Uh, it it, bring, it can it can cause a refinement of our inner man, or it can it can bring us to, a like a say a greater place of. Uh, self discipline, obviously. And also. Just the ability to. Resist things first of all, so that's that builds. Character. <laughs> and um, yeah temptation also brings a kind of like Benji was saying it, it, it does enable us to advance to a greater uh, level of um, perhaps even the things that we we do and don't like or allow in our lives in the first place. So that's part of how something that was once daunting becomes in somewhat insignificant to us is because through learning not to yield to temptation and learning to rise above things, uh, our tastes even of what uh, is and is not delightful for delightful or appealing to us that changes it's not something that is continually uh, a burden to us or something that causes us so much 
the stress when we try to resist it. Again, it's just it's the, it's even the way that the mind works physically. The more that you, it's it's the idea of putting something into practice and that even changing neural pathways in your brain. That's mm -hmm. that's it's like the way habits work, for instance. Temptation, I think, is very much interwoven with the the way habits work in life. So it takes it takes a an effort to establish a new pattern to build new habits just as it takes time to let an old pattern wear off or wear down to get rid of bad or old habits so i think that's that's actually a real even systematic way <laughs> to approach uh, the resistance of temptation But again, as for like there being like a, a secret to resisting, there really isn't. Just as Derek Prince would say, this secret to endurance is just to endure. Mm -hmm. You'll get better at it too. Yeah. And, and I think the cool part, coming back to Elijah's soup analogy, <laughs> uh, is that <clears throat> we've all been tasked with our own challenges mm -hmm. and our own temptations and <clears throat> through overcoming those you know we all gain experience and I guess you could use a set of tools and each of them are unique from you know what we overcame uh, and we're all bringing those and we can all help each other out with them which I think is just a super uh, enlightening way to look at it certainly the mm -hmm. challenges and the temptations that we face are hard but the Lord has put them in our life because he has ordained us to overcome them yeah so it's like a thank you lord for sure because mm -hmm. it's not just challenges for the sake of challenges right yeah well, lord i pray even now father that you would well that you would help each one of us lord to uh, Lord, rise in this this uh, sphere of life, Lord, and even as young men and uh, examples to other young people in our community. Uh, Lord, Lord, even as as Benji touched on, may we uh, even see and engage in our own struggles with a consciousness of the the community that we are a part of, the body that we are one with. And uh, Lord, we, we do know that there, just as there is nothing good in us, there's also nothing necessarily that enables us to resist the enemy. Uh, and even to walk in your ways, uh, which does not come from you, which is not enabled by you. And so, Lord, it is certainly our prayer for our individual selves and for one another, Lord, to, to be empowered by you in this. So, Lord, we, we do know you are our deliverer, and Lord, even as your Son encourages us to pray, may you indeed not lead us into temptation, but Father, would you deliver us from the enemy and all his schemes against us as sons in your household. And uh, Lord, even teach us and lead us in how we might uh, come against the enemy when he seeks to deceive us and uh, Lord I do just bless each one of us here in this respect in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Amen. <coughs> Alright see if we can get through this next chapter <coughs> I mean we can but You sure about that? Anything can happen <laughs> This is chapter 12 
on wandering thoughts and dejection. One. Two things trouble you. One is how you may avoid wandering thoughts. The other, how you may be sustained against dejection. As to the former, you will never cure them by set reflections. You must not expect to do the work of grace by the resources and activity of nature. Be simply content to yield your will to God without reservation. And whenever any state of suffering is brought before you, accept it as his will, and an absolute abandonment to his guidance. Do not go out in search of these crucifixions, but when God permits them to reach you without your having sought them, they need never pass without your deriving profit from them. Receive everything that God presents to your mind, notwithstanding the shrinking of nature, as a trial by which he would exercise and strengthen your faith. There you go. Mm -hmm. Never trouble yourself to inquire whether you will have strength to endure what is presented, if it should actually come upon you, for the moment of trial will have its appointed and sufficient grace. That of the present moment is to behold the afflictions present tranquilly, and to feel willing to receive them whenever it should be the will of God to bestow them. Go on cheerfully and confidently in this trust. If this state of the will should not change in consequence of a voluntary attachment to something out of the will of God, it will continue forever. Your imagination will doubtless wander to a thousand matters of vanity. It will be subject to more or less agitation according to your situation and the character of the objects presented in, to its regard. But what matter? The imagination, as St. Teresa declares, is the fool of the household. It is constantly busy in making some bustle or other to distract the mind which cannot avoid beholding the images which it exhibits. The attention is inevitable and is a true distraction. But so long as it is involuntary, it does not separate us from God. Nothing can do that but some distraction of the will. You will never have wandering thoughts if you never will to have them. And may then say with truth that you have prayed without ceasing. Whenever you perceive that you have involuntarily strayed away, return without effort, and you will tranquilly find God again without any disturbance of soul. As long as you are not aware of it, it is no wandering of the heart. When it is made manifest, look to God at once with fidelity. And you will find that this simple faithfulness to Him will be the occasion of blessing you with His more constant and more familiar indwelling. Yeah, like where he talks about just returning with without effort. Like it's something that doesn't even need to be um, dealt with with the mind. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's not saying that's the it's the mind that's kind of taking you away, so it's not something that you can go back to mm -hmm. with the mind. And I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Like God said as well, like if you're learn to like not let your thoughts stray, but like you've successfully, you know, kept in prayer for the whole time, kind of goes back to a, the prayer within the heart mm -hmm. like we read earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting concept. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's, even though your thoughts may wander, it's not your heart or your will that's wandered. And that's what really matters. Yeah, because your, your thoughts will pretty much inevitably wander. Yeah, you can't yeah. really control that, unfortunately. But, yeah, I really do like that constant, like, lit candle of prayer yeah. in your heart. That we're talking about in chapter 4. It was just like a, yeah, that is kind of what I think of as kind of being in the flow. It's constantly having your heart and your, you know, when you're consciously thinking, your mind towards God. And it's any time where life kind of gets in the way and, 
you know, even if, you know, you're working and it's been a couple hours, if you perceive that it's wandered, you just pull it back. And you don't sit there and, oh my goodness, how could I let that go on? I'm worthless, you know, with that effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what comes to mind again is the the uh, taking thoughts captive, so mm -hmm. it's not a matter of us learning to just not have those thoughts which can lead us astray. It's just not being led astray by them. Mm -hmm. So that is a good point. The imagination is uh, although the author wouldn't really put this uh, put it this way himself. Imagination is not an entirely bad thing, so I I don't think I would even go so far as to call it a a <laughs> fool of the household. Well, that is probably not a bad way to put it, because the imagination is, it's it is a very childish thing, which is actually part of what makes it so powerful for creative <coughs> endeavors. But the imagination as a a thing which governs that household, mm -hmm. that's obviously problematic. The imagination should not be that which dictates the the heart and the mind or the will. Because when that's the case then you're you kind of just you do everything in uh, you, you do everything whimsically. And while that might be endearing like an endearing uh, conception of a person for some people that's it's not a it's not a it's not a wise way at all of going about life because there's no level of obviously no level of self discipline or of being led or governed by something that's beyond uh, the flesh or our own earthly nature. And unfortunately, that makes you very uh, wide open to other less savory or pure spiritual influences. So it won't ever be just, if you're led in, or you're living life in that way, you'll never end up just staying as a person led by your own nature. You will eventually be uh, taken captive yourself by a force beyond you and so you're not at the end of the day you're not actually your own person led by your own imagination so those adorable ideas of a free-spirited person someone that is fully expressive of their heart quote-unquote in their imagination that's something that you should very much be on guard about those kind of descriptions of people um, anyways A frequent and easy recollection is one of the fruits of this faithful readiness to leave all wanderings as soon as they are perceived. But it must not be supposed that it can be accomplished by our own labors. Such efforts would produce trouble, scrupulosity, and restlessness in all those matters in which you have most occasion to be free. You will be constantly dreading lest you should lose the presence of God and continually endeavoring to recover it. You will surround yourself with the creations of your own imagination, and thus the presence of God, which ought by its sweetness and illumination to assist us in everything which comes before us in his providence, will have the effect of keeping us always in a tumult and render us incapable of performing the exterior duties of our condition. So again, it's this, this beauty behind the concept of learning to do non-doing. Mm -hmm. It's put that way as a translation of a Chinese, <coughs> a Chinese concept, actually. It's known as Wu Wei, that's what it's called. It's uh, 
it's a concept mentioned in the Analex. You will actually come across it. You guys will come across it at some point if you haven't already. It's mentioned in some of the Taoist Chinese texts as well, but it's it's that idea of uh, it's applied in uh, theories about leadership, from leadership to family life to personal life, learning, or even from how to do things skillfully in an occupation. It's learning to do things without uh, putting conscious effort into them. Mm -hmm. I think that's how that's how a practice starts. Say we're again we're we're talking about say building a habit. Conscious effort is what initiates that, and it's how we build it into ourselves. But eventually, we start to live life in a way, or or do that thing in a way that's not conscious in the same way that it was when we started trying to build it in ourselves or enhance it and then it becomes uh, second nature to us so that can be expanded beyond skills is what I'm trying to say um, learning to be found in the presence of God is not something that we have to be so scrupulous about, uh, or at least we shouldn't expect it to have to always be that way. There is probably a certain level of intensity we should apply in a certain season of life to make sure that we we establish that uh, practice in our life, but eventually we come to a place where that becomes natural to us and that's where we're really trying to that's what we're really trying to attain unto be never troubled then at the loss of the sensible presence of God but above all beware of seeking to retain him by a multitude of argumentative and reflective acts be satisfied during the day and while about the details of your daily duties, with a general and interior view of God, so that if asked at any moment whither your heart is tending, you may answer with truth that it is toward God, though the attention of your mind may be then engrossed by something else. Be not troubled by the wanderings of your imagination which you cannot restrain. How often do we wander through the fear of wandering and the regret the gr regret that we have done so? What would you say of a traveler who, instead of constantly advancing in his journey, should employ his time in anticipating the falls which he might suffer, or in weeping over the place where one had happened? On, on, you would say to him, on, without looking behind or stopping. We must proceed, as the apostle bids us, that we may abound more and more. First Thessalonians 4 verse 1. The abundance of the love of God will be of more service in correcting us than all our restlessness and selfish reflections. This rule is simple enough, but nature, accustomed to the intricacies of reasoning and <coughs> reflection, considers it as altogether too simple. We want to help ourselves and to communicate more impulse to our progress. But it is the very excellency of the precept that it confines us to a state of naked faith, sustained by God alone in our absolute abandonment to Him, and leads us to the death of self by stifling all remains of it, whatever. In this way we shall not be led to increase the external devotional practices of such as are exceedingly occupied, or are feeble in body, but shall be contented with turning them all into simple love. Thus we shall only act as constrained by love, and shall never be overburdened, for we shall do only what we love to do. And now is the place that we eventually come to. That's, I, I will say it's not an easy place to get. I know I haven't gotten there yet. 
Yeah, to where you're only doing what you love to do because you love what God loves. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful, though. I know I've brought it up several times, but it's just, again, that, that last part of that, uh, it's been called like a spiritual autobiography of Confucius, where that last greatest achievement of his life was being able to uh, follow his heart, so to speak, without stepping over the bounds. So this is number two. <clears throat> Dejection often arises from the fact that in seeking God we have not so found Him as to content us. The desire to find Him is not the desire to possess Him. It is simply a selfish anxiety to be assured, our own consolation, that we do possess Him. Poor nature, depressed and discouraged, is impatient of the restraints of naked faith, where every support is withdrawn. It is grieved to be traveling, as it were, in the air, where it cannot behold its own progress towards perfection. Its pride is irritated by a view of its defects, and this sentiment is mistaken for humility. It longs from self-love to behold itself perfect. It is vexed that it is not so already. It is impatient, haughty, and out of temper with itself and everyone else. Sad state, as though the work of God could be accomplished by our ill humor. As though the peace of God could be attained by means of such interior restlessness. Martha, Martha, why art thou troubled and anxious about many things? One thing is needful, to love him and to, to sit attentively at his feet. When we are truly abandoned to God, all things are accomplished without the performance of useless labor. We suffer ourselves to be guided in perfect trust. For the future, we will whatever God wills and shut our eyes to everything else. For the present, we give ourselves up to the fulfillment of His designs. I think that's what you were just talking about. To where it's not like we're not always trying to you know, consciously do it. We're not always seeking to do that labor kind of manually. It just kind of happens as we fall into his flow. It's kind mm. of a beautiful thing. I think one uh, interesting perspective you may see or you may have become aware of reading this book so far is just how simple all of this is. It's it's not a matter of having to go on some it's it's not it's 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 not necessary for us to solve this complex mental or spiritual problem as as if it's like some kind of puzzle. The only complexity <clears throat> that, kind of our stubbornness really. that yeah that brings any confusion in this life is comes from ourselves that's the real yeah. it comes from self it's that self-centeredness that causes the the many and varied misleading notions about uh, what life should and <laughs> should not be it's it's learning that that secret, if you will, of yieldedness unto God, that's really all that is required. And I will say it once more, that what, what we do have the real trouble with, what, what makes things seem so complex or unattainable or distant or even impossible sometimes, that all comes from ourselves that's not that those notions and that perspective doesn't come from God God is the one that makes what seems impossible possible yeah really uh, mm -hmm. go ahead 
No. no. Yeah, I mean, it keeps kind of bringing it up in different points, but it's that same desire to always, you know, feel like God is there with us. Mm -hmm. But it's not even because we want to be close to God, it's because we want to be reassured that we're on the right path. You know, it's for ourselves. And so we keep trying to hold on to that moment, even though it's past. And we keep doing everything that we can to, you know, have another moment where we're in the mm -hmm. presence of God. But that's it's for the wrong means and with the wrong intentions. Yeah. It's what this what the nature of self uh excites in us and demands in us and from us is just simple things like I have to know. God says, no, you don't. And then we learn to yield. Or the soul says, I have to feel. Whether it's feel something, anything from feeling something base to feeling certain about oneself. That feeling, that demand to have to feel can encompass or does encompass many things. And God once again says, no, you don't have to. And then you learn to yield. Or the soul or the self says I have to see I have to hear again no you don't and when it asks the most foundational question perhaps when this, this the self says I have to perhaps it asks I have to be whatever it is saying it has to be then even if it's that if, even if it's a good thing and something that the individual should be like a son even then God says yes but there's a way in which you will become this mm -hmm. that's that naked faith that it mm -hmm. keeps referring to so again it doesn't mean that we we don't we, we, we are trying to reach a place where we don't know and where we don't feel or see or hear or anything it's not like we're trying to become a a block of wood but we're willing to become that because our we have such a a trust and a faith in who God is and who he has called us to be and what he's doing in our lives and so that's Yeah, we it's we get to that we we eventually get to that place, Lord willing, when we are not struggling anymore against the self or with God. Yeah, I'm having a hard time putting this into to words, perhaps because I'm not I'm not very advanced in the process myself because I, I can certainly say as I suppose many of us could say that we are still very much in that struggling phase in which granted we are being trained so to speak and refined by God where we eventually can come to that place Sufficient for every day is the good and the evil thereof. This daily doing of the will of God is the coming of his kingdom within us. It's pretty big. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, our daily bread. We should be faithless indeed and guilty of heathen distrust did we desire to penetrate the future which God has hidden from us. Leave it to him. Let him make it short or long, bitter or sweet. Let him do with it even as it shall please himself. The most perfect preparation for this future 
whatever it may be, is to die to every will of our own and to yield ourselves wholly up to his. We shall in this frame of mind be ready to receive all the grace suitable to whatever state it shall be the will of God to develop in and around us. Three. When we are thus prepared for every event, we begin to feel the rock under our feet at the very bottom of the abyss. We are ready to suppose every imaginable evil of ourselves, but we throw ourselves blindly into the arms of God, forgetting and losing everything else. This forgetfulness of self is the most perfect renouncement of self and acceptance of God. It is the sacrifice of self-love. It would be a thousand times more agreeable to accuse and condemn ourselves, to torment body and mind, rather than to forget. So once again, it's that point of not trying to know that we have subdued the self and, and feel the satisfaction of that because then self has actually won a victory mm. in the very <laughs> uh, yeah, in, in the very act of our thinking we have subdued it. Yeah, it's really it's like an actual and literal forgetting of the self. That's the truest denial of self. It's almost to the point where it's not even about overcoming self, it's about attaining something. And through that, you're going to not. Right. Yeah, it's like the losing self. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you actually aren't even consciously trying to, like, choose, like, understand what you want and then choose a different way, right? Mm-hmm. It's actually you just forget. <laughs> or rather, shift your focus on something different, like, lines are the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's the only point or the only time that it makes sense is when there's something greater that you're pursuing and that that is God's will his living will and his ways his uh, the real work of his spirit in your life and through you that is that other focus that enables us to really forget self trying to think of a metaphor for that <laughs> to, to make a little more sense for <clears throat> maybe this is a goofy way to put it but if your focus is on becoming a selfless person so that you can say you're a selfless person then it's like training yourself for battle so that you can kill to kill but the reason that we, at least any decent man, trains for battle is to protect his country, to protect his family. I mean, obviously, that's not necessarily a realistic way to put it because <laughs> because people are enlisted to, to fight for whatever the cause their country uh, is fighting for. But assuming that you are led by... A, a, a good ruler, or you, you live in a a, uh, a country in which the heart of the people are one and they're under that unity, then again, it's you, you train for battle because there's there's something that is dear to you that you are fighting for. So that for the the focus is not even on the battle. It's on preserving or trying even to attain unto what is precious to you. It's not about the it's not about the battle. There's still a lot that we learn about the battle. In fact, the battle perhaps brings us to love and appreciate that which we're protecting and fighting for all the more. And in a sense, maybe this is applicable too. We learn to appreciate those that we're fighting with 
and appreciate more he who leads us into that battle and directs us knowing that when we are separated from our own people so to speak or separated from the command of the 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 general or the king then we're helpless mm -hmm. I think of it as self is a wall mm -hmm. and on the other side of that wall is God's will and we can sit there and brick by brick manually take down each thing of self meanwhile congratulating ourselves. you know mm -hmm. look at this the wall's almost down brick by brick you know but in that sense, we're actually making the wall stronger, and we don't even know it. You know, it's that false humility. And what this is talking about here is like it's almost just getting a wrecking ball and just annihilating the wall. And you're not even, it's not even something you notice because you want what's on the other side of the wall so bad, you're not even focusing on the wall anymore. Hmm. Yeah. All right, where's y'all's analogies? Analogy contest. I'm just kidding, you don't. It's actually interesting. Justin sent out a video on metaphors. That was a while ago, I thought. It, it was a while ago, but it actually mentioned metaphors as bypassing the intellect. Oh, I don't remember that. Yeah. Which is something that was, it was interesting to me. I don't remember that. Was that, was that the Ted Ed video? It was. It? it was like 11 year old videos. Or something. It was briefly mentioned, but it, it was, it made me really think of metaphors because they do kind of like even when I'm thinking that, of that's an interesting way to put it I wouldn't say it bypasses the book I, I mean even I, I anyways thought, I don't want to distract her from the topic yeah anyway. yeah we can continue <laughs> talk about that topic because everyone listening now is probably just like rolling their eyes waiting for us to get past this part of the description or they're like skipping, wait 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 I want to hear more right okay well, they can ask you about it. Cause they and know. we've already achieved the awkward badge. It's over. <laughs> I think Kim and Matt may be the only ones that listen to it these days. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, con let's continue. Such an abandonment is an annihilation of self-love in which it no longer finds any nourishment. Then the heart begins to expand. We begin to feel lighter for having thrown off the burden of self which we formerly carried. We are astounded to behold the simplicity and straightness of the way. We thought there was a need of strife and constant exertion, but we now perceive that there is little to do, that it is sufficient to look to God with confidence, without reasoning either upon the past or the future, regarding him as a loving father who leads us every moment by the hand. If some distraction or other should hide him for a moment, without stopping to look at it, we simply turn again to him from whom we had departed. If we commit faults, we repent with a repentance holy of love. In returning to God, he makes us feel whatever we ought. Sin seems hideous but we love the humiliation of which it is the cause and for which God permitted it. As the reflections of our pride upon our defects are bitter, disheartening, and vexatious, so the return of the soul towards God is recollected, peaceful, and sustained by confidence. You will find by experience how much more your progress will be aided by the simple peaceful turning to God than by all your chagrin and spite. What does that mean? It's like a, a like a disturbed and irritated feeling towards something. Is that chagrin? How do you say that? I'm probably mispronouncing it. Wait, it is I chagrin. Usually, it probably is. <laughs> Let me see. Here chagrin. I go again. Yeah, it is chagrin. Yeah. I only encounter that word in books, so <laughs> forgive me. Chagrin. Where are we? Chagrin. And by all your chagrin and spite at the faults that exist in you. Only be faithful and turning quietly towards God alone. The moment you perceive 
what you have done. Do not stop to argue with yourself. You can gain nothing from that quarter. When you accuse yourself of your misery, I see but you and yourself in consolation. Oh, I'm sorry, consultation. Poor wisdom that will issue from where God is not. Whose hand is it that must pluck you out of the mire? Your own? Alas, you are buried deeper than thought and cannot help yourself. The more and more this very... S now I'm coming across another word. <laughs> slew, I guess, yeah. This very slew is nothing but self. The whole of your trouble consists in the inability to leave yourself. And do you expect to increase your chances by dwelling constantly upon your defects, in feeding your sensitiveness by a view of your folly? You will in this way only increase your difficulties, while the gentlest look towards God would calm your heart. It is His presence that causes us to go forth from self, and when He has accomplished that, we are in peace. But how are we to go forth? Simply by turning gently towards God, and gradually forming the habit of so doing, by a faithful persistence in it. Whenever we perceive that we have wandered from Him. Yeah, I marked that last part down. Just simply turning gently towards God. I bet, oh, we kind of we've been talking about it, but just yeah, just not focusing on not doing something, like not letting your thoughts wander, or not giving in to temptation. Mm. It's yeah, when you said it earlier, it's it's simply going another direction, not going the other direction, and stop and look behind you stop look behind you or maybe even worse taking some steps back it's basically just going one way mm -hmm. and you there's going to be some rocks and you're going to trip you're going to see another trail maybe that looks really enticing you may go down it a little bit but the point is not just look behind us it's relying turning to God um, by faithful persistence you know like it says here um, and just going forward and there's that point of it being something that we form a habit of doing too that's mm -hmm. yeah. important I just yeah uh, like you were already saying I just love how simple it is because mm. our intellect really does cloud things up and especially when you think about it so much you know and it could be out of a good place like you care about it so you're thinking about it a lot mm. You really do just get cluttered up with all these like ways that you think things are working or that they should work or that they have to work. And you just kind of exhaust yourself, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's just so simple. Yeah. Yeah, again, like without effort, mm -hmm. you know, not by your means. <coughs> As to that natural dejection, which arises from a melancholic temperament, it belongs purely to the body, and is the province of the physician. It is true that it is constantly recurring, but let it be born in peace, as we receive from his hands a fever or any other bodily ailment. The question is not what is the state of our feelings, but what is the condition of our will? Let us will to have what is the condition of our will. Let us will to have whatever we have, and not to have whatever we have not. We would not even be delivered from our sufferings, for it is God's place to apportion to us our crosses and our joys. In the midst of affliction we rejoice, as did the Apostle. I'm talking about Paul. But it is not joy of the feelings, but of the will. The wicked are wretched in the midst of their...
pleasures, because they are never content with their state. They are always desiring to remove some thorn or to add some flower to their present condition. The faithful soul, on the other hand, has a will which is perfectly free. It accepts, without questioning, whatever bitter blessings God develops, wills them, from them, and embraces them. It would not be freed from them if it could be accomplished by a simple wish. Such a wish would be an act of originating in self, and contrary to its abandonment to providence. And it is desirous that this abandonment should be absolutely perfect. If there be anything capable of setting a soul in a large place, it is this absolute abandonment to God. It diffuses the soul, it diffuses in the soul a peace which flows as a river, and a righteousness which is as the waves of the sea. Isaiah 48, verse 18. If there be anything that can render the soul calm, dissipate its scruples and dispel its fears, sweeten its sufferings by the anointing of love, impart strength to it in all its actions, and spread abroad the joy of the Holy Spirit in its countenance and words. It is the simple, free, and childlike repose in the arms of God. I think this chapter has a lot to do with just the simple reliance and trust in God and the realization that we are of how reliant we are on the Father and how uh, how much control we don't have actually in our lives because I Obviously, we see when we're without God, we're out of control. As simple as that sounds, I mean, this is all simple, like you guys are saying. It's a simple concept, but the dealing with self and the soul is just really tough. Because the soul is just such a such a beast, such an animal. It's just hard to wrangle, hard to subdue. And that can only be done by subduing ourselves, our souls to and our will to the Father and letting Him lead us and following after Him mm. and not being pulled like a like an animal but being you know, holding a hand of God and follow like a sheep like yeah. a walk like uh, sort of because I, I mean the, sh- the sheep still kick against the goats <laughs> Like we, it would be more like a child holding your father's hand and yeah. walking with him, wanting to go where he's going, not trying to go against it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think what does stick out is the, I don't know, it's kind of a different way of looking at childlike faith and kind of the ins and outs yeah. of how that plays out within our inner man. You know, and despite all of our shortcomings, not sitting there and worrying about them all the time as if it's going to make us unworthy. I mean, it does, but we are worthy through God, right? Mm. And only through Him. And so instead of sitting there trying to eliminate all of our shortcomings ourselves, it is really that childlike faith and going into the arms of God and like Elijah said, holding his hand throughout life. Coming to him when we're tempted, coming to him in our happy times and our in our valleys and in our struggles. In mm-hmm. everything. And making that a habit and building that in to ourselves. Not for reassurement that we're on the right path but for His will. But because we just honestly just want to know where He's going mm-hmm. and we want to go there too. And who He is. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, these were very encouraging two chapters. And I hope we can uh, not remember necessarily the the point like the, the series of points made in chapters as much as just grasp the essence of it and put it, put it into practice in our own lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Which one of you want to pray for us to wrap it up? It's Tim Tim. Benji gets to or I get to or you get to or who? I'll do. Alright, go ahead. He will do. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your people, Lord, your body in which you have, Lord, given us each other in a special way, Lord, to, to seek your wisdom, Father, and to seek your business, to seek your heart, Lord, and to be able to, to have others that we can, Lord, it, <laughs> come into same heart and mind and wanting to to Lord know you Lord as our true father and um, I do just pray for this wisdom Lord that we wouldn't um, take it in a way that is self centered or that fulfills any part of self Lord but that we would be so focused on that desire, that um, that pure childlike desire to grow in the Father's heart and stature. So I just thank you, Lord, for um, each thing that you do, Lord, that indeed brings us close to you. And for each experience, Father, I pray that you would continue to enlighten us and speak to us, Lord, in this season. Help us to be, Lord, grounded when we come to the place of temptation or of lowness in our flesh. I just pray that we would be able to overcome by your strength, Lord, and by Lord, as I prayed earlier, that desire to know you and to follow in your kingdom ways. Father, so I pray that you bless, Lord, even the ones listening in um, and indeed ourselves as we continue to meditate upon this, not in any false way I would pray, Lord, but in true desire. So I thank you for this night, Lord, and <coughs> may your hand, Lord, be upon each life as we continue to press on in your way. Amen. Amen. Next two chapters, three chapters. Um, three. They're, kind of, they're pretty small. 